From Abuja. I'm glad you're a part of our show. We appreciate you. I'm Magnus Paco, and this is Magnus Paco GBA. Global Views Africa. As always, it's all about how we can raise the level of living. That's what it's all about. In view today, human capital development as the solution for poverty in Africa. We will rely mostly on Bill Gates in one of his gatekeepers discussions. Truly, the world is fortunate to have Bill Gates. As we will see, he takes us through a gripping statistical story of where the world is in the fight against poverty and how China and India have succeeded using human capital. Concluding, he suggests that although the battle ahead may be tougher for Africa, through human capital development and ingenuity, Africa can also win. But before this, in our hidden economics, we look at the value of strategic partnerships. Now up next in our quick view, we rank countries by the share of government expenditure to GDP. That's coming right up. National income or GDP can be calculated using a so-called expenditure approach. In this approach, total national income can be determined by adding up the spending of households, businesses, governments, and foreign trade. In this manner, the role of government in the economy can be evaluated based on its spending and indeed the share of the spending in the nation's total expenditure. It is usually the government that spends on social goods like primary education, basic health care, sanitation, and other public goods like roads, bridges, and electricity. Indeed, the spending by government is typically aimed to create an enabling environment for human capital to thrive. In this connection, which of the following top four largest economies in the world has the highest government expenditure as a ratio of GDP or the national income? China, Germany, Japan, or the United States of America. Which of the following key African countries has the highest government expenditure as a ratio of GDP? Egypt, Kenya, Nigeria, or South Africa. Stay with us for our answers coming up shortly. Still in view, Africa can reduce poverty with human capital. Now up next in our hidden economics, the value of strategic partnerships. Stay with us, don't go away. Love. Girl, I don't give you all I got, but it's not enough for you Show you fire me, got a pot of love Now I be say I don't be getting enough of you yeah. Waiting me down, nothing I can do for my baby, my baby Anytime when you need me come to me, my shawty, my shawty, Waiting me down, nothing I can do for my baby, my baby 
Baby, by the young Joe boy, whose birth name is Joseph Akim Fenwa Delnus. Joe Boy is a fast rising Nigerian singer and songwriter. He studied human resources at the University of Lagos. Now, in the melodious song Baby, Joe Boy is saying, There is nothing I can do for my baby. Baby, share your day for me as I day for you. That's it, folks. In any strategic relationship, you must have extraordinary things you do for each other. If it is not extraordinary, it is not strategic. When looking for a strategic partnership, do not expend or consume resources trying to force a potential partnership that will not provide a strategic and compelling benefit. So you won't be left asking questions or holding the bag. There are some critical issues to consider. 1. Would the potential partnership contribute to meeting your strategic needs? 2. What does this potential partner bring to the table? 3. Is it something that can fade or easily perish? 4. Are there already signals concerning significant weaknesses that you see in the potential partner? 5. Are you sure that you can handle your own end of the bargain? And finally, what are the opportunity costs of pursuing this partnership? In the end, don't be carried away by looks. That thing you see on the surface, while it may be attractive, may not convey the real value you want or need. Try to dig deeper to see what lies on the inside. They are the ones that determine durability. How do you know what is on the inside? Do a little research and don't throw away history that easily. History is a record of behavior. Its benefits are huge and will help you assess future potential costs. Folks, you can't always do it all. Look for strategic partners, even among poor people. Your human capital and innovation can improve matters for both of you. Our hidden economics for you. Anytime when you need me come to me, my shade, my shade, what did me die? Nothing I can do for my baby, my baby, my shade, oh, they take my baby, my baby. What you wanna do, girl? Where you wanna go? Cause anywhere you go, girl, I go follow go. Cause I like the way you back it up, the way you go down low, and that's the reason they be hating on you. I Baby, you're the baddest Step on the dance floor and show you madness I'll be a king, you be my real earnest Shut up the guy, damn you are the fly Before we start our discussion Here are our quick view answers Germany with 43.9% has the highest expenditure to GDP ratio among the world's largest economies. South Africa with a ratio of 33.6% tops Africa. For comments, adverse and sponsorship, please see our information displayed on the screen. So what really is the solution to poverty in Africa? I have always been sure that it is vigorous human capital development. That's what the leading economies of the world have over Africa. Human capital. Today we look at what Bill Gates has to say on the matter. Speaking at one of his goalkeepers forums, Bill Gates sets up the question of whether poverty is inevitable. Answering, he says, of course, that poverty is never inevitable. He contends that if you are extremely poor, much of your time and energy 
would go mainly towards survival and not toward creating anything. Let's listen to it. Is poverty inevitable? And there's a clear answer here. The answer is no. Uh, we asked 2,000 people on the internet uh, about what they thought was going on with poverty. We told them the uh, 1990 number and asked them to guess uh, where it had gone. And their guess was that it had fallen from that 36% down to 22%. In fact, the real line is far, far better. It drops all the way down to 9%. That means 1.2 billion people have overcome extreme poverty since 1990. As The Economist Max Roser has said, the newspapers could have run a headline, number of people in poverty fell by 137,000 since yesterday, every single day for 25 years, and been right. Real news. According to the World Bank, uh, th this definition we use is a cutoff of about $1.90 per day of la or less. So, Imagine what it's like to live uh, in extreme poverty. You have to think about the basics, like your next meal all the time. Uh, a, a, an extremely poor family uh, mostly has access only to the food that they grow themselves. If you have a bad harvest, uh, if one of your animals gets sick, uh, you're going to have a period where you're not getting enough food. Uh, daughters in these families have to gather water and wood they have to cook dinners on an open fire with lots of smoke, and then they have to clean everything up. Uh, if they get a chance to do schoolwork at all, it's going to be very late at night. Uh, so if they, they need a lamp, if they have it, uh, to be able to do that work. So the upshot is, if you're extremely poor, your time and energy really goes to mere survival. Uh, you, getting out of extreme poverty is not the end goal. We want people lifted up way beyond extreme poverty. Next, Bill Gates discusses how people can be lifted out of poverty. He shows, using a dot map, how well over 1 billion people have been taken out of poverty since 1990, worldwide. He goes further to show how the distribution of global poverty has changed and become more of an African phenomenon, which sadly, may intensify. Concluding, Bill Gates talks about how poverty prevents people from investing in themselves as they struggle to just survive. China beat the malady using education. Africa can do the same, he says. We've created uh, some graphs here where we have a single dot representing a million people. And so right now you're seeing uh, the number of dots uh, that represent the number of people who overcame poverty in this last generation, since 1990. And it's, it's really great to see how we made uh, that incredible reduction uh, because it hints, okay, what remains, what do we have to do in the future? Uh, and the progress uh, came really in, in two great waves. Uh, the first wave was China. In 1990, not very long ago, 66% of people in China were extremely poor. So you can see all the dots there, each representing again a million people. But over just a, a, a short period, uh, 15 years, their extreme poverty declined by over 500 million. Now China's a unique place, but the improvement in people's lives there is one of the most astonishing examples of progress in world history. The second wave came in India. Progress there uh, started later, and it's been more gradual, but it's also a, an impressive trend. India went from 400 million people in extreme poverty in 2005 to just under 100 million today. And over the next several decades, uh, that number's going to drop uh, quite a bit. So the question we face here is can we create a third great wave of poverty reduction in the rest of the world that will bring uh, extreme poverty near to eradication? Now our message here, it's not gonna be easy. 
uh, we can go back to our dots, uh, again, looking at each one representing a million people. Uh, but now we're going to look at the people who remain in extreme poverty. Uh, so starting back in, in 1990, uh, we're going to take all those dots and do a pie chart that gives us a sense of what it looked like by region back in 1990. And so you can see Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, the blue part there, represented a, a relatively small slice of extreme poverty in 1990. But because this has fallen so quickly in East and South Asia, uh, so we're dropping the total number of people a lot. But also, as we drop those numbers, you can see that that sub-Saharan slice, the blue slice, is getting to be a very substantial uh, part of this pie. Uh, in fact, if we project this out to 2050, it's rather stunning. Uh, it's a trend that I, I sort of was aware of, but even uh, I was surprised when we ran these numbers uh, that it shows that almost 90% of the people remaining in extreme poverty will be in Sub-Saharan Africa by 2050. If we zoom in even more and take it at the country level, uh, we can see that there's a quite uh, variability in the progress here. Uh, we see that uh, uh, a few countries represent a lot of what remains, uh, about a dozen here. In fact, if you just take the, the two countries with the most people, uh, which would be the Democratic Republic of Congo and Nigeria, that alone will be 40% of the entire world's uh, population in extreme poverty. And if we zoom even further in and look at a map of Nigeria and say, okay, where inside Nigeria will we have this? Uh, this is a, uh, based on 2013 data. We can see that it's not spread evenly. Uh, as you move towards the north, there's far more poverty uh, than in the south. And so this gap uh, that you're seeing there uh, grows quite a bit over time. And so uh, what this means is that this poverty is going to be a feature of life in a few places. And these are places uh, where there are the fewest opportunities. Uh, often, uh, in some of these places, there's violence, a lack of stability. Uh, these are places where climate change will make these subsistence farmers' lives more difficult. Uh, also, these are often places where the governance is not providing the primary health care or education, even at a basic level. And uh, every one of these places are exactly where we're experiencing rapid population growth. Finally, saying the same things I've been saying for many years, he emphasizes that Africa needs human capital development and innovation with new techniques especially in agriculture and other sectors of the economy. Here again is Bill Gates. Uh, the yield uh, for wheat, which was very, very meager, uh, was changed by modern technology and techniques. And now uh, we're at almost four times the, the productivity uh, that is output for a, uh, a certain amount of land. That kind of innovation, in fact, that's another innovation we need to bring to Africa. Uh, but innovation uh, can appear in many, many different sectors. Uh, let's start with the investments in the people, uh, primarily in their health and education, uh, which economists, including now the World Bank, is emphasizing this human capital. Uh, China uh, set a great example here. In 1990, one in three Chinese children were chronically malnourished, which means that not only physically, but also mentally, uh, they never fully developed. They did not achieve their uh, potential. And the typical uh, Chinese youth uh, never got into high school. Well, since then, uh, China has solved that malnutrition problem. And in education now, almost all students not only graduate from uh, high school, a very high percentage, almost half, attend college. And so, you know, you, you just look at those cities in China and you see, wow, something miraculous came out of those human capital investments. And so to create this third wave of poverty reduction, Sub-Saharan Africa's young need the same level of investment in their human capital. Of course, 
the size of that investment uh, is going to be very large because of this population growth, the doubling in their youth population by 2050. Uh, and so human capital and our looking at that has never been more important. Uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa for these youthful generation, uh, we need to get a lot of resources there and help those countries build these systems. The world we want, a world in which every person can dream of a better future and make it come true, is a world without extreme poverty. The great Scottish political economist Adam Smith, who is renowned as the father of modern economics, is also best known for his 1776 book, An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations. In this seminal book, Smith includes human capital in his definition of capital. Since then, people like Alfred Marshall, Theodore Schultz, Gary Becker and Jacob Minzer have emphasized the significance of skills and knowledge as important tools for economic development. Now, in my inquiry into the nature and causes of poverty and underdevelopment, it has become clear to me that human capital deficiency is the primary culprit. And so we must arrest this deficiency today. Today, as we have seen in our discussion, Bill Gates also feels very strongly that human capital development holds the key for defeating poverty and underdevelopment across the world and, of course, in Africa. If Africa is to catch up with the so-called West, it must understand that what is required foremost is investment in human capital. It is investment in people that will create the diffusion that can influence productivity and therefore higher real incomes in the future. Nothing is more important than education and overall human capital development. I define human capital as the stock of knowledge, habits, wellness, and personal attributes, especially creativity, innovation, and the ability to perform and produce economic value. Therefore, human capital is the most important element for increased productivity and ending poverty. And so we need good quality education to assemble this stock of knowledge. Quality, not quantity, is what is required. In Africa, we have tended to emphasize paper qualification in certificates. We have developed unforgiving graduation ladders from which our young prospects often trip and drop out of school, bearing all the quality and promise they have possessed. One can only imagine how many potential sources of economic redemption our educational system might have buried by failing to allow our young people to go on to showcase the one thing they can do better than anyone else. Folks, we must design systems that promote our kids and show that they can be the best in at least one thing. They must not know everything to be good at something. I'm Magnus Paco and that's my view.